you have a show <laughs> and you have, say, eight episodes on a network, um, you should have at least six writers writing that show. Uh, I think mm. we've all seen what happens when one person writes all of it. That's a Tyler Perry movie. <laughs> this is not especially good. <laughs> uh- Welcome to Visionaries. We are back with live episodes. We're joined today by Akila Hughes. Akila has many, many different hats. I believe I've interacted with her content in so many different capacities, be it with Crook Media, be it with her YouTube channel, Once Upon a Time. A woman of many hats and many talents. So Akila, we're super, super excited to be welcoming you on. Welcome to the show. Awesome. Thank you so much. And apologies for the viewers. <laughs> Next time I'm on, I promise you'll see my face. All, all good. Wanted to have you here today because uh, obviously you've been engaging with a lot of the a lot of what's happening around the writer strike with the writer skills of America. For context, um, you know, to the listeners maybe not familiar, um, can you kind of give us a top level overview of what's going on in the in- entertainment world right now with the writer strike? Yeah. So the Writers Guild uh, of America East and West, um, the contract that they had with AMPTP is up. It ended um, a couple of weeks ago. And basically, uh, we had voted to authorize a strike in the event that they wouldn't come to the table. Um, And if they weren't interested in uh, negotiating what we saw as fair practices. So that includes, um, you know, a a minimum size for writer's rooms, meaning if you have a show (laughs) and you have, say, eight episodes on a network, um, you should have at least six writers writing that show. Uh, I think Mm. we've all seen what happens when one person writes all of it. That's a Tyler Perry movie. (laughs) This is not especially good. Um, So, and part of the reason for that isn't just that the product, the end product isn't that great. Um, it's also, you know, to give leeway to other writers, to uh, give writers experience. So not only with writing with other people, but being able to go to set when some other people might be doing rewrites in the studio, that sort of thing. Um, so that's one of the main things. Another issue that, um, you know, the AMPTP, which really um, is, is like, a, it's a collective of studios, just so you all understand. Um wouldn't really negotiate on was this idea that AI could uh, be credited with writing um, and creating scripts in the future. Um, Meaning, you know, we have all of this AI technology, we're hearing about it every day, it's getting stronger and stronger, it's our overlord. Um, And writers and the Writers Guild wanted to protect against this technology, basically scraping the internet, scraping every bit of literature that's available, getting better at writing, and then making our jobs obsolete. So it's a very long-winded way of saying that this is a fight to protect an industry. um, And it's, I think in a lot of ways, uh, I tweeted this, but I I see it as sort of a canary in the coal mine because uh, this industry is seen as very cushy, right? Like, (laughs) it's not like we're, you know, in a mine. It's not like we're like laying bricks. It's not um, extreme physical labor. But there is a lot of labor. And if an industry like this uh, is so quick to get rid of um, actual workers and uh, is, you know, looking forward to a a time where they don't have to pay writers at all or they move us into what, you know, is sort of known as a gig economy, like an Uber, you know, they hire you for a day, you get paid that and then you go along your way. um, And, you know, it doesn't cover health insurance. It doesn't cover all these other things. It's a very vast issue. But um, We're basically just saying that if this industry fails to do what's right, what's going to stop them from doing this across the board? Um, And it's obviously not just like AI that can write, you know, people have already been automated out of like physical labor jobs. Um, But, you know, if there's a marketing person in Cincinnati, Ohio, who writes cute copy for Twitter, and that is their day job, they could easily be replaced. And so you know, this has a real trickle down effect. And so we're outside striking from either nine to one or one to five at studios uh, all over LA and New York, anywhere there's productions, we're trying to stop them. Um, But to your point, (laughs) the overall entertainment industry is having this reckoning. Um, I'm also a member of the Screen Actors Guild, and we have a vote to authorize a strike coming up, meaning that if enough people vote, then if, sorry, somebody's doing donuts outside. I love LA. Um, but if enough people in our union, and it's a much bigger union, it's like 180,000 people versus the um, 10 or 20,000 that are in the WGA, uh, 
you know, if we vote to authorize the strike by an overwhelming number, then that means, again, you know, these negotiations don't go the right way. You have a shutdown of writers and performers across the entertainment industry. So, you know, the fallout of that is very expensive for the city of Los Angeles, for Hollywood, for, <laughs> for people who enjoy watching anything at home. Um, you know, we haven't seen the effects of it yet, but in past strikes, you know, it's the reason we have the Kardashians. <laughs> it's the reason, um, you know, reality TV became this stronghold. And you might say, okay, well, some people like reality TV. Let's just let that, let it ride. Um, but they also don't have that <laughs> in in the kitty right now. They don't have that cooking. So a lot of different um, unions that sort of work in those sorts of roles. So like IATSE, for example, um, which is more of a like crew union, like they're not going to cross the picket line. So there's a real chance that this shuts down new entertainment for 2024, 2025, et cetera. Yeah. And a lot of shows have already been affected, right? Like some very familiar names to people, American dad and family guys. Uh, a lot of their staff have walked off set basically, you know, no longer producing those shows and creating those shows, big mouth, uh, blade and or like, I, I'm looking at a list of them now, just like some of these really, really big shows, uh, you know, notably like the ones that I think people immediately noticed are the late night shows. So, you know, Jimmy Fallon show and Jimmy Kimmel show and Stephen Colbert, and Saturday Night Live have all been impacted in various different ways due to this. Some of them have just stopped and ceased altogether. Um, and I think maybe a little helpful to some people because, you know, I I work in entertainment, so I understand kind of what the dynamic looks like here between all these people um, and, and what the process looks like. But you've been on multiple fronts, whether, you know, as an actor or whether as a writer in some of these productions where do the writers sit in the process of producing these shows? And like, can you describe the, maybe the role a little bit that they play in creating them? Because I think some people, you know, are hearing a lot of news about this stuff, but don't really actually understand like the process of taking something from idea to television. Absolutely. Like it's, um, it's funny. I think a lot of times people just don't really know how the sausage is made. Like they're like, somebody writes it, then somebody shoots it. And that's, that's actually how it works. But if we go all the way to the beginning of the process, um, oftentimes, TV shows generally are pitched by writers teaming up with producers, uh, and then they go into what is commonly known in the industry as development hell. But development <laughs> is that process. Um, this is another sticking point in the contract negotiations, which is you know um, how long they that the studios are allowed to hold on to projects after they've accepted them and they've said that they want to make them. Um, because the the process for getting paid after you've sold a show <laughs> is really fraught. Um, as a person who sold a show, I can tell you, you know, it wasn't like I sold the show, they gave me a check, and then I was, like, balling out of control. It was like I sold a show, I wrote script after script, had meeting after meeting, months passed, I got paid a little bit of what I was overall promised in a contract. Then there was plenty of time given to the studio to say yes or no, where I wasn't getting paid. Then they were said, you know, maybe here's some more notes. You write again, you get paid a little bit, a fraction of what, you know, you are owed overall. And then again, they can sit on their hands. They can, you know, in, I guess a, a concrete example, um, I was doing a show with a huge company, <laughs> one of the biggest companies in the world. Um, and we had, uh, I think, a three-month uh, period where they could decide whether they wanted to make it or not. And we ran out the clock to the day several times, meaning we didn't get paid. <laughs> and I say we, me and two other writers and, and producers didn't get paid in that interim. And so what that leads to is people not qualifying for health insurance from the guild. Um, you know, that, I mean, I could go on and on about the effects, but let's get back on track. So the process is really writers sell the show. Um, writers write the show and they rewrite and they rewrite and they rewrite. Eventually, if you get very lucky, the show gets greenlit and a writer's room is put together. A thing that a lot of studios have chosen to do in lieu of real writer's rooms is what's called mini rooms. And this became really popular in the pandemic because it's, you know, we couldn't all be in the same room together. People knew who they trusted. They could choose four of their friends, have a couple of Zoom meetings, go off and write their scripts, come back together. Um, and things weren't really being made at that point anyway. So there was always a chance that they would come together in a larger room with a lot of the work already done, and then have writers assigned to finish the script. Um, 
But so the option is you can have a mini room or you have a real writer's room, which in the 90s, <laughs> right, back when people were making millions and millions of dollars in entertainment, that meant you had anywhere between 10 to 20 writers writing 24 episodes a season. Now it can look like three writers writing eight episodes. The money difference in that is a difference of generational wealth, right? Like this is... I have a house money and I am on food stamps trying to survive money. And and that is really what we're at now. So to continue on, we have the writer's room. Um, ideally, you know, that is eight to 10 weeks of um, daily meetings, breaking story, writing down what happens, figuring out who's best at telling what story, telling your own stories in the writer's room. Then you go off and write your scripts. You have enough other writers in the room to make sure the scripts are good. And then when they finally get to the production phase, you know, as a writer, you should have the right to go to set and see them making your episode. Because if, if you wrote something down and it's not quite as good um, when performed or it doesn't make sense for the scene or whatever creative difference comes up, you are the person, you are the representative for the show who is there to say, this makes sense, this doesn't make sense. And a lot of that is just learning on the job. Like it's something like in any other industry, it'd be shadowing. You get to see what everybody does. It makes you a better writer to figure out exactly what is possible on screen. Um, that has pretty much been eroded. Like I've, I've written for several shows. I have, and all of this being post crooked. So <laughs> post 2021, I have not been invited to see my, my work created uh, on set. Um, and that's a really common story. And what that, the sort of problem that poses is you don't get better at your job uh, if you don't get to see how it's made. And when you don't get better at your job in that way, you don't necessarily get invited to do more writing. You can't get a higher position in a writer's room, especially when there are these smaller and smaller, more insular, more, you know, nepotism rooms. <laughs> it creates an environment where only people who can afford to starve for months can sell their projects, or someone who has, you know, a family who's supporting them 100% um, can afford to make these things. So for average writers, or even just young people starting out, it's a really fraught time in the industry. Gotcha. Thank you for explaining that, too. I think that uh, most people, like you said, don't understand the inner machinations of entertainment and like what goes in, you know, to their favorite television show and what brings it to life. The other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit because I know this is a part of the fight is um, streaming and its effects on residuals um, in particular. So, you know, the, one of the biggest changes since the uh, last agreement was reached between the studios and the writers, one of the biggest changes has been the the impact of streaming. And we have seen in other entertainment cases this be, be a problem as well, too. You know, notably very well publicized because she's a blockbuster star and they're you know, one of the biggest companies in all of entertainment. Scarlett Johansson sued Disney during the pandemic because Disney took Black Widow, her movie, and put it direct to streaming, even though it was meant to have a big theater release. And she was suing over the fact that the payout, uh, some of the clauses in her contract for the box office payout were not going to be honored because it was going to streaming and the economics of streaming and the theater are very different. And obviously, you know, that was settled, but I think that was a very monumental case because it, it sort of teed up, I think, what is you know going to happen more and more, which is as entertainment shifts, so does the way that these contracts work, the way that productions work, the way that payouts work. And I think that streaming, while streaming has made content more accessible now than ever, I think at the same time, it has had a very negative effect on entertainment because there is so, so many different people that have these jobs, as you were saying, that the economics just aren't the same, right? It's not some, somebody paying $10, $15 for a movie ticket. It's someone paying 10 to $15 for an entire bundle of entertainment, billions of hours of content in the case of ser services like Netflix, right? Can you talk about, from your perspective, how entertainment has changed with streaming and how the roles as the creators of entertainment have changed with streaming? Totally. So the last time the contracts were negotiated, which I believe was like 2007 or 8, please feel free to fact check me. For the, podcast. I think it's, I, the strike was in 2007, so I that's think that's right. right. Yes. Streaming as an idea was not what Netflix is today. It was <laughs> barely what YouTube is today. Um, it was seen as this is the money you'll get for internet productions, meaning things that, you know, the the industry saw as, you know, 500 to 1,000 views on a YouTube channel, but you have an actual union writing it. Um, and it was not seen as 
the dominant form of how people would consume entertainment. Fast forward, we have binge watching from Netflix. We have the pandemic, which has people in their homes wanting to watch everything on demand. The way that we consume entertainment is completely different now. Like appointment viewing doesn't exist except for like HBO on Sundays every, <laughs> every so often. Um, and so the model should change. It hasn't. Um, and so I'm glad you brought up residuals because that is like a major issue, um, especially with the SAG negotiations coming up. But currently with the Writers Guild, um, I don't believe that people get paid much at all from residuals, meaning, you know, back in the day, there would be a rerun of your TV show if you wrote for any major TV show. And that was a huge payout because it was in prime time, meaning you got a cut of the ad revenue, you got a cut of, like, you got a higher payout because of the time it aired. Um, you got paid based on how many eyes were on it. And since it wasn't competing with everything <laughs> that exists, that was a much larger number. Um, now it, it is not how, like, it, it's sort of like if you, um, put all of your faith in your tax return being like <laughs> the money you were making for the year. It's just not enough. It, and it, it also, you know, um, has to accrue over time. So, in my own experience, I've received residual checks that were like 50 cents, you know, <laughs> and that's, I've seen people who've gotten three cents, you know, it, it's worth less than the paper it was printed on. Um, and I think that you're right. Scarlett Johansson is in a much stronger position to negotiate for those things because she is an A-list star. But imagine, you know, all of the shows you didn't watch, <laughs> right. Um, that aren't super popular but it was still someone's job. And now not only is there never a rerun, so if you're in a waiting room at a hospital, if you're getting your hair done somewhere, you know, if you just happen to be walking past a sports bar, it's not on. So that person's not getting paid an extra dollar. Um, but even if it is on streaming, they're not really getting paid an extra dollar. So I can rewatch Stranger Things 50 times if I want to. And back in the day, that meant real money for writers. That meant you could buy a house. <laughs> and now it means nothing. It always counts as the same thing. And a lot of these contracts, um, you know, because it does vary by company, by production, but a lot of them don't even have any carve outs for streaming residuals. So it's basically just saying that now people have unfettered access to your work, no money to you for that at all. And, you know, uh, Snoop Dogg recently and famously was asking how it's possible that, you know, you can get a million, a billion streams of a song, but not a million dollars. The same is true for any of these productions, which is why I think um, it feels really impactful that people like the Duffer Brothers from Stranger Things are, you know, saying like, we're going to stop our production because, you know, the money isn't here for the people who created it. And the reason, I mean, if you look at Netflix, they are a content churning engine but they have five or six major hits. And those shows aren't even making people rich these days. So really, I think it's, um, it's a damning, <laughs> uh, it's just an damning indictment of this industry overall that we've made the art that has made these companies sustainable and given these CEOs yachts, more than one, <laughs> more than one yacht, um, you know, that we don't value the writers who are writing that art. So what's the fix in your opinion, right? Like what, what fixes this? Cause it's a, it's a very monumental moment, right? We you just mentioned that the 2007 strike. And so it's been a long time since this issue has come up. And, and as you mentioned, some of the other guilds, producers, guilds, screen actors, guilds, et cetera, are going to also have their own fights here with the streaming services, right? Who are the prim primary deliverers of content. What's the fix? How, like how, how, if you could, you know, make it better tomorrow, like what is, what is the solution? I, I love the union. I've been uh, out there striking a little bit less this week. Cause I, I have a foot thing. <laughs> I literally have to go to the doctor. So I, I have an excuse and they've okayed that. Um, but I think that unions are the solution. I think that, you know, these are what the, what the WGA is asking for is less than 1% of the revenue that these companies bring in less than 1%. Um, for some companies, it's not even a drop in the bucket. Like for Apple, for example, <laughs> they are not an entertainment company first. Their revenue is through the roof for phones and computers and all kinds of tech. It would not be hard for them to give 1% of their revenue back to the creative process that is also building, you know, Apple TV Plus, which two years ago was nothing. 
Um, and so I think the first thing is they have to agree to these terms. It's not putting them out. It's not breaking the bank. Um, but I do think that having a minimum number of people in writers' rooms and adding, you know, adding those jobs as the episode orders get larger, because there are some shows, for example, Abbott Elementary has more and more episodes being ordered each season because it is a massive hit. Um, you know, you can't rely on six people to write a show and, and have it maintain the level of um, of quality. And it's also like, you know, I think the side conversation is they're selling ads against this work. So the companies aren't just making money because you pay for Netflix and you're rewatching a show that aired originally on, you know, whatever network and is now on Netflix. They're also earning money from all of these advertising deals. Um, so I think pushing back towards what we had is really what we're looking for. And I think, you know, streaming needs to be seen um, as seriously as network television, um, as big of a player, since it's currently a bigger player than network television. I think the entire deals have to be remade. Um, and, you know, the original proposals from the WGA really do address most of it. Um, I, I honestly think they could go further. You know, I think like having six writers for eight episodes is a really good deal for a network. I think eight writers would be great. <laughs> I think having paid writers assistance would be great. I think, um, you know, strengthening the ability of writers to get health insurance by saying you have this long to um, decide whether you're making the show. And having, you know, tape, uh, studios have to really come to the table in good faith and say, we are going to make this show sooner in the process so that, you know, we don't have writers who aren't allowed <laughs> because of their contracts to go write anything else, but are still waiting on feedback. Um, you know, I, I think that if this existed in other industries, um, you would see the same kind of pushback. And so I think that really it's just about making uh, – you know, making people feel valued because the the work is valuable. Hundred percent, hundred percent. I think that's super super important. I think you know the biggest biggest thing is just better educating. I think people just to, to get behind it. And I'm glad to see like at least you know various different advocates pushing for the writers, right? And and supporting the writers. You know, you you said you've been out there striking and and been there with everyone else. What what has it been like out there in that environment? And and who else like no you know notable folks are showing up and showing up and to help support what you guys are doing? Absolutely, great question. So I. Think I think the first way I would describe it is a little surreal. Um, and I think that everything feels surreal post post pandemic, <laughs> whatever you would call this era that we're in. Um, but I think what feels surreal about it is that like, these seem like really obvious fights that, that should be over by now. Um, and so what's been really interesting about literally parking my car four blocks away from Paramount, getting my sign out of the car, <laughs> wandering down the street to tons of cars honking in support, um, endless pizza and donuts and coffee being <laughs> delivered. You know, it sounds like a party. Um, but for example, my foot is messed up. <laughs> like I literally have to have surgery soon. And so there are people who, you know, are less mobile than I am out there for four hours in the heat of Los Angeles. Um, you know, screaming at the top of their lungs, writing really clever signs, um, you know, and it feels like camaraderie. It feels almost like a, like a summer camp experience where it's like, I've gotten to know some people really well on the line. There have been a ton of notable people come through. Um, at Paramount in particular, I think it's been uh, notable how many showrunners have come through. So we've had like Jenny Connor, who is a huge showrunner. She was a showrunner for girls. She also does Single Drunk Female on Freeform, which is a Disney property. Um, you know, I've seen Ava DuVernay out at Paramount, uh, Mara Braca Keel, who originally did Girlfriends. She also did Being Mary Jane. Um, Raphael Bob Waxberg, who is famous for Bojack Horseman, and he's a great author. Um, and so you know, it, it, Adam Conover is not only um, <laughs> on the front line of all of these different strikes, but he's been um, really vocal and a great advocate just like online and like on CNN. Um, Travis Helwig, who I used to work with at Crooked, uh, but he also worked with Adam Conover on Adam Ruins Everything. He used to work at Ellen. <laughs> um, like, he's also been a really strong advocate. He's a representative for the WGA. He's actually my captain. So he's been the person who's been saying, like, these are the hours. This is what you need to do to get out of it if you are sick, um, if you have a problem. Here's, you know, the guidelines. They've been really good about educating us. But um, that part of it has been really notable. 
also like Mindy Kaling, a person that I I don't really associate with like being on the front lines. I mean, all the characters she plays are pretty in the house. Um, but people forget she started as a writer. Um, she writes a lot of the shows that she sold recently. Um, and so, you know, I think just seeing those people at that stature, people who really, you know, because of the WGA, they have to be there. Like that is actually part of the union is if we are on strike, you're supposed to show up and have boots on the ground. Um, but the fact that they uh, prioritize it, um, show up consistently, have been so gracious with their time, um, have been excited to meet the writers who are out there um, and are also veterans of the striking. So they're just like, it's a marathon, not a sprint. Walk slower, wear more comfortable shoes, <laughs> here's some sunscreen. Um, you know, I think it, it feels really intergenerational. It feels just really um, supportive. And I think that it, when I first heard that we were doing it, I had a little bit of anxiety about going because I'm like, I don't know what it's going to be like. I don't, I didn't ask my friends if they were going to go at the same time. So I was like, am I going to know anybody? And they're so happy to have people there. But there have also been, um, really supportive people in New York, like Josh Gondelman, who I love. He's a stand-up comedian. He's also a great writer. He was at Jesus and Marrow, our head great writer. Great show, by the way. Yeah, great honestly, show. I love that show. I miss it. I miss it. I miss it. I miss it so much. We're, we're going to talk about a show that we both like based on, based off your Twitter feed in a minute. But nonetheless, oh, Jesus and Marrow, great, great, yes. great. And so it's like he's been leading with the horn. People have just been really, really great at every stop. I saw today that Flava Flav was at Warner Brothers out here handing out pizza. Like, it's a, it really runs the gamut day to day um chris pine very famous actor walking the line yesterday um so you know i i think that in you know i guess the sexier version of it is like it's a place to see and be seen but the reality is it's like it affects people at every level of this process people who you know are in huge franchise movies and also people who are like just starting out new to town and you know have a dream to have their stuff actually on tv at some point yeah, well said. Well said. It, we, uh, I, I tuned in too for the Hassan Piker IRL stream, uh, <laughs> yes. live, live on the line too. So that's, uh, yeah, frequent, frequent. My entire team is frequent Hassan consumers. So, yeah, uh, always, always, always intriguing. You know, what, what are you, what is the, like, your sense, right? Like, is, is, if you had to kind of guess based off of everything right now, everything I have heard from other people, mostly not actual writers themselves, not people in the union. But outsiders is that this strike is probably going to be a very, very, very long process, and it's going to take a long time to get over it. If you had to sort of identify where we're at in the current stage of negotiations and it had to guess how long this will be, where are we at in that process? I mean, I, I will say, um, you know, assuming it's going to make an ass out of you and me, <laughs> it's hard to say, right? I'm not in those meetings. And from what I understand, they have not even come back to the table. So, um, you know, in the past, they've sometimes gone on for more than 100 days. Um, the strikes historically get shorter and shorter. Um, and I do think that, uh, you know, something that hasn't really been in commentary, but I have this hunch is partially because the optics aren't great. Um, and we now live in a, the era of the internet where it's incredibly strong. Like if you think about 2007 internet, there were three people on, was, was Twitter even a thing? Like I wasn't on Twitter until 2009. You know, um, Facebook had just become like public to everyone and not just college students. Like this is a completely different era that we're entering. Um, and so I think that the we have a really strong hand. Like the the WGA is not bluffing. People want content. There's a reason there's more shows than ever. Um, and so I think that, you know, because the studios have so much money, they think they're in a really good negotiating space. But the reality is people aren't going to want to watch things that are not their hit shows. Um, you know, there's a reason they are doing 100 seasons of Stranger Things. And it's because it's how they get people to stay on Netflix. Is Netflix really worth $20 a month if there's no new season on the horizon? Um I think the other thing to sort of consider uh, because of the internet is that people are talking more directly. And so a lot of people who tend to produce or be crew on reality shows have been very vocal about the fact that there's not a lot of production that's already ready to put out. Um, and so they're calling the studios bluff. Uh, you know, I think Zaslov over at WB famously was saying, you know, we have plenty of content to make it through this. We're going to weather this. Um, but 
the people who actually make those shows are saying bullshit. I also think that like cross union solidarity is huge. I mean, we had people from the Starbucks union <laughs> showing up to march alongside us. Like the teachers union, hospital unions have shut down productions by saying we're not going to cross the picket line. School like teacher unions are saying we're not going to let you all shoot in this school. Um and so I think you know, uh, my belief, and maybe it's naivete, is that this will be the shortest one. I think it will go at least 60 days, but I have a hard time believing that we'll make it to 90. Um, the truth is, I think that money is the root of all evil, but also the backbone of the industry. And LA is mute losing money every day. Productions that start and shut down are losing a ton of money every day. Um, and the, the reality of these studios is that they're all trying to bounce back from the pandemic. Um, they had a little bit of a boost. They're not seeing the biggest boost. Uh, and so we'll see if, you know, if they really do think they can weather it, but I doubt it. I also think that like, if they prolong this, heads will roll and not the writers. <laughs> I don't see, you know, the, the investors of these huge companies being really excited about lower and lower returns because of the, the bravado <laughs> of CEOs who really just want that third yacht. Right. Yeah, I think I think you're totally right. I think at one point investors will the longer and longer delays happen. Right. And I it's it's going to be even worse, I think, if like you know, an agreement's reached to the people have to crunch to meet the original timelines, right, of, of these shows, that's just going to make, like, you know, imagine being a writer just got off strike and then you have to deal with that. You have to crunch write a show, which is going to be awful from a labor perspective. But, you know, assuming assuming the humane thing is done and, like, the strike happens and strike ends and then there's, like, a delay in production, you know, because of the strike, I, I do see a world, I think you're right, where a lot of these investors are pissed because it's just going to delay like quarter production or predicted quarter results and everything else as well when you you are betting on the hit shows and you're right like a lot of the hit shows are what's being affected right now too so i mean fall is the biggest time for tv especially for new shows so it's a big bet that um you know the shows that they were able to produce already are gonna be hits that they're not going to be able to, you know, that they're not going to rely on something like Abbott Elementary coming back this summer or the fall. Um, I, I think that it's a real gamble. And also, like, if those shows tank in the past, they'll pull it. They'll pull it mid-season and put up something new. Or they'll just be like, okay, we'll move around the schedule and we'll push this to Friday. They're not going to have that leeway. Um, and so I, I really do have a hard time believing they're going to try to push it past the fall. Um, but they also are at a disadvantage with that. We're in L.A. The weather is <laughs> good enough to keep striking in the winter. Yeah, right. For sure. <laughs> um, I think we're going to hop to some questions for Prime here in a second. But I do I do want to riff with you just a little bit on, on the show I was referring to. One of the things that has, uh, will survive because it is already written and produced is Succession. Yes. And I know you're a big Succession fan. I am also a big Succession <laughs> fan. Yes. Uh, Akilah, who is the worst person on Succession? I think that's the most fun <laughs> argument to have. Yes, I've had this conversation a lot more recently. Um, and I think, you know, my answer has changed season to season. But I think without a doubt this season, Roman Roy is just not dealing with spoiler alert. <laughs> I'm not going to do the spoiler. Some people might want to watch it later. But the main spoiler of the season, the biggest shakeup, he is not uh, processing that, and he is lashing out everywhere. He is cutting off his nose to spite his face. I think that man um, is headed for doom. You know, I think that we, he will not make it the next few episodes without some real tribulation. Is how I feel. I think the worst person is Connor Roy, and I actually heard. <laughs> like I actually something. heard. I I actually heard Kieran Culkin talk about this recently, uh, the actor behind Roman, and I think this what's interesting about this is um, him saying it, but I actually agree with it. Connor is the worst character because he's like actually trapping someone, right? Like the the Willa plot. For, for those unfamiliar, Connor Roy, son not involved in the family business. Go watch Succession, great show, very fun. Um, but also, uh, you know, Connor Roy trap entraps Willa, uh, a former call girl, into marriage, um, and uh, it's just really fucking sad. Uh, to be honest, there's not a, another another way to say it. It's just sad. She's just like stuck, um, and that's a terrible, awful thing to do to someone. So, I mean, I guess that's fair, but I I just can't. This I don't know if you're caught up, but this past episode, <laughs> I'm like two two episodes behind. I think right okay. now, but 
Well, when you get caught up, you, let's do another episode where we can just talk about <laughs> Roman because I'm like, Roman actually has to be pushed out a flight of stairs. Roman is dead to me now. I I always find myself like wanting to root for Kendall to get back on the straight and path, and it just never happens. It's like yeah. it's like uh, should get better. Things should get better. Nope. Fuck. Like totally. it's a, you know this the entire wave of the show has just uh it's been that so. But yeah, I mean, Succession will stay on, everyone. It's not affected by this. <laughs> <laughs> totally. Um, but I, I'm going to throw it over to Prame. Prame, go go ahead. What is uh, What questions you got for Akila? So, Akila, huge fan. Super glad we were able to get you on. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> with everything with the WGA, WGA strike, do you have any do's and don'ts, I guess, for anyone striking now or with how everything seems to be going? Way at a larger level in the future got it okay um i mean i think you know the wga put out some really strong guidelines so um these apply to members but obviously if you don't want to be a scab <laughs> which you shouldn't want to be a scab um this is sort of what they recommended uh so if you are a creative person who's interested in becoming a writer right now don't um <laughs> You know, Pencils Down is sort of the uh, unofficial, like, fight song that we're all saying. But the reality is they don't want us taking meetings with producers. They don't want us, um, you know, if you're writing your scripts secretly right now, that's fine. But you should not be talking to your agent about how to sell it. You should not be getting notes on projects. Um, you know, the way that it's been put to me by Adam Conover is we need to make this as painful as possible for the studios, meaning they need to know that like this is a collective saying we're not going to we're not going to make any work for you until you come back to the table um, and negotiate in good faith. So I would say no scabby activities. Um, if you, uh, you know, happen to drive past the strike in any city, honk your horn. <laughs> Honk it. Part of the reason they ask you to honk is not for like just the morale of the writers. It disrupts production. Like it's really that simple. Like if you're driving down Melrose Avenue and they're shooting something at Paramount Studios, they have to call cut when people start honking and it gets too distracting and loud. Um, it's really hard to account for that sort of thing. Uh, now, obviously, follow your local laws. I would never tell you to break any laws. But if you are allowed to honk and your honk, your horn is you know working, or maybe you just saw somebody do a weird maneuver right there at the studio. Give it a little toot toot. <laughs> um, I'd also say, you know, uh, th at this point, they're not recommending that you like stop watching anything on streaming or anything like that. But I would say follow people who really are leaders in this. Um, you know, I post less on Twitter than I used to. So I would absolutely throw it to people like Travis Helwig, uh, who he's not mostly on Twitter, but he's, he posts a lot on Instagram. Adam Conover is doing a really great job both on Instagram and Twitter. Josh Gondelman, same these are people who work with the WGA, were um, heavily involved in the contracts that got rejected. Um, and so, you know, as they, as moves are made, they're going to be the first people to be spreading that sort of thing around. Um, so I would say absolutely that. And then, like, if you just tweeted hashtag WGA strike, that would be good. The numbers scare, <laughs> really scare the studios. So I think you just have to be aware of the fact that, like, the more visible this strike is, the sooner it will resolve, the sooner you'll get really good original content from people who are super funny, super smart, super deep, the most creative people. Like uh, another person I, I should have shouted out who I saw on the lines, obviously, uh, Cord Jefferson, who wrote for Watchmen, um, The Good Place, Succession also. Um, but, you know, Damon Lindelof, who did Lost and <laughs> The Leftovers and everything else. I mean, there really are heavy hitters out here fighting all for the same belief, which is writers deserve to be valued for the, the process, you know. Anybody who's ever written a paper for school, even if you don't fashion yourself a writer, knows that it's not easy work. My favorite thing about being a writer <laughs> is that we can talk shit about the profession. It's hard. Like, no one wants to be writing. It, like, they, we want to do our jobs. Don't get us wrong. But, like, it's – Lady Gaga always says it's like heart surgery. Like, you put – it's invasive. You have to put so much of yourself into it. And I think that um, – you know, we just really want to see that be valued. So I think just pay attention to what's happening. Um, and if they give more we got guidance regarding, you know, cancel this <laughs> subscription, whatever, you know, uh, they haven't said it yet, but just be looking out for that sort of information. Also, stay abreast of the SAG, um, Screen Actors Guild, uh, strike authorization vote. 
I know that that vote is due really soon. Um, and, you know, once it's authorized, if it's authorized, that means if the negotiations don't go the way we want, then we've already voted to not be on set. So I'll be striking while I'm striking. <laughs> so I keep saying, like, I'll just walk back and forth with both sides. Yeah, we have a lot of listeners. We can see geolocation. We have a lot of listeners in LA. So uh, you yeah. heard the woman. Do your job. Do your yeah. job. Yeah, um. also, you can join the picket line. They, people are very welcoming to that sort of thing. So, you know, again, follow Adam Conover, follow Travis Helwig, follow Josh Gondelman, you know, depending on the city. Um, I know that there have been, like, outposts in Boston and Atlanta as well, but, like, follow those leaders. And if you have some extra time and don't mind walking, it's a really good vibe. <laughs> it's the funniest, smartest people you've ever uh, encountered writing very funny things and having good conversations. So at least the spirits are pretty high out there. So I know you've been down the Tears of the Kingdom hole <laughs> a little bit. Yes. Absolutely. What are your top five games or I guess maybe even like the top five that have found you down that hole of like, oh, my God, I just need more. I need more right now. Oh, that's so funny. Great question. So, yeah, I I feel like I've been a lifelong gamer, um, but I it wasn't really like a thing you'd call yourself in the 90s. Like, I feel like in the early 90s, like I played a lot of Sonic CD because <laughs> we had an old computer. So that was the first time I was like dreaming about a video game and like learned how to beat a level because I had played so many hours that I dreamt the solution <laughs> to like a puzzle. Um, so I would say, obviously, Sonic CD has got to be in there. Fortnite is one of my truest loves. I really love Battle Royale. I love it so much. I haven't played much in the past couple of weeks, only because of <laughs> Tears of the Kingdom. Um, and I will say switching between those controllers has been tough because I don't play Fortnite on Switch. I play it on Xbox. So obviously Sonic, um, Fortnite, Breath of the Wild was mind-blowing. Obviously, for me, that's the greatest game of all time. I haven't finished Tears of the Kingdom, so I might be proven wrong. You know, it might be the sequel. It might be The Empire Strikes Back right now. But it is just... Um, Breath of the Wild as an open-world game has just been... I loved it so, so much. Um, last night, I did dream about Tears of the Kingdom. So it's already on the list. It's been... That's four games, and it's like two of them are relatively recent. Um... And you know what? A fifth game on my, like, <laughs> very large Mount Rushmore of, like, games I became obsessed with. Ori and the Blind Forest. I played that game nonstop with my friend Vlad in, like, 2016 or something. We just would not stop. It took forever to beat. It's so difficult. But it's so beautiful and rewarding. Um, I just, I think that, like, for someone who... Like, that was the game that got me back into games after years of being like, well, I guess I can play, like, fighting games. Like, I can play Smash Bros. I can play, like, you know, on the couch next to my friend at a party. But this was like, oh, this is going to be the, my personality for the next six months. Like, that was the one where I was like, well, shit, games are, <laughs> games are in their golden era again. Yeah, I, I was literally playing Tears of the Kingdom before this, before I started doing show prep. So it's been... <laughs> Same. Uh, well... like, I literally paused in a shrine. I'm like, we'll be back. <laughs> <laughs> we'll be back. Um, I actually the the video people will see this, but my my pro thing of choice has been the uh, the Hori Split Pad Pro. This is not a paid endorsement. This thing's fucking awesome. I bought it for Monster Hunter. I didn't play as much Monster Hunter on this as I did PC, but yeah, this has been great. This has been very good for my my uh, Tears of the Kingdom playthrough. It's been a fun game. I, I I have a colleague that think that wrote something today that's a bit of a chore. I agree with that. It does feel a little bit like a chore. It's a lot of fucking work in that yeah, game, but I'm it's sorry. a fun game. <laughs> I'm not a builder. I mean, I build in Fortnite, but I don't. I don't like the construction of things. Like that man with the sign who's just standing at the side of the road. I'm done helping him. <laughs> oh, I did figure that one out. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Well, the thing is, you get a million chances, but I just find whatever crude object. I'm like, here's a big ass boulder. <laughs> like now the sign's up. I'm not doing any real work with that man. <laughs> done i there's several of them too i've i've helped two of them so far there's many many of those though yeah um it's... the koroks that are lost i'm like sorry man <laughs> good luck though <laughs> oh God. the the fun the funniest part actually of all of of tears of the kingdom has been and i saw alpha rad tweet this the other day that like every time he opens twitter there's like 20 new ways to torture a korok like yeah. i have seen like 
people like crucifying yes. crucifying Koroks. <laughs> like like put, somebody put them on like a, a a spigot and like put them in front of a fire to rotate on the <laughs> fire with a wheel too to like oh cook them gosh. this it's really terrible there's a lot of Korok abuse going on support for the Koroks yeah yeah they need a union <laughs> <laughs> yeah right there you go there you go <laughs> But it is a fun game. It's uh, it's just so intensive for like non Zelda people. If you're listening to this and you have not played uh, Breath of the Wild, definitely do that first because yeah. it's like half half of the work. Yeah, uh, if, if this is like double the work, it's like they you know, it's a very impressive game. But goddamn, yes. it's a lot of content. Seriously, so. I'm like my god. <laughs> Well, thank you, Akila, for joining us. We really appreciate it. Good luck out there on on the strike. We hope your foot also recovers well too. Uh, thank you so and, much. And good luck. I I recently had a major surgery, so I I understand. Uh, it's quite quite the recovery. So hope yeah. everything goes well. Thank um, you. Good luck to you. Good luck to the guild. Uh, and putting or putting together a deal and and hopefully resolving something favorably for everyone. And thank you again for joining us. Awesome. Thank you so much for having me. And uh, yeah, I'd love to come back. And also, yeah, good recovery to you too. Thanks. Appreciate it. Thanks for watching Visionaries on YouTube. For more content, please subscribe to the Overcome channel.